Hi, I'm Daniel Wordsworth. For more than 30 years, I've experienced war zones, natural disasters, refugee camps, and sprawling slums. Now I'm going to show you a better and more optimistic world. This podcast is Finding Good. Daniel, I need to come back to something I asked you the other day when we were chatting. This has not been broadcast before. This has not been podcast <laughs> uh, before. Oh, okay, so, yeah, yeah. Without notice. I said to you at the start of the year, you know, everyone makes New Year's resolutions, etc. I said, are you happy? And your reply was? <laughs> <laughs> now you're making me fool about I said, I am profoundly unhappy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I need to unpack that a little. Yeah. Because I've worked with you now for a year. Um, the podcast is finding good. It seems to me, and I may have this wrong, in which case we may have to sit down and talk about my employment, <laughs> but it seems to me that we are working towards finding good and happiness within this podcast. You're going to tell me we're not. We're not. Okay. <laughs> we're not. We're not in the slightest trying to find happiness in this podcast. Yeah, we are trying to find good, but not to make people happy. Uh, not to make people happy. So, so what do I mean by that? Well, I, I have this, you know, I get, oh, okay, I'll throw this out there. You know, you see these, you see these TED Talks and there's books and there's um, speeches and, and people selling you this idea that we have to be happy all the time. Yeah. Now, my problem with that is if happy is your drug of choice and you are on this constant high of happiness, where do you get the next high from? Where do you go from that? Surely the peaks and troughs are what make us human. That make up our makes up our life, yeah? So this idea no. that we should be hold happy, be no. happy all the time <laughs> is ridiculous. You disagree with it? Yeah. Which part? All of that bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, I, I want to give an account of why I'm profoundly unhappy. I want to explain that. But secondly, I wanted to say, what's up with all the happiness stuff, <laughs> right? Like... It's a bit like imagine if somebody bought a Cray supercomputer and you said, uh, what do you plan on doing with that? And the person said, I'm going to play Tetris. I'm going to play Mario Kart. Right? I'm going to play games on a supercomputer. Yep. You would just say, well, you can, but it seems like a horrible waste of potential. And what I'm saying, and I, maybe I'll say it in a stark way, the pursuit of happiness is a horrible waste of human potential. Happiness. We are, as far as we know, we're the only conscious entities in the, not just our known universe, in, 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 in any observable place that we can see. And, and if, you, if you don't for a second, if you can't grapple with how immense that is. You, through my lens, I look at that and say, we are sacred, wondrous creatures. And we are given 70 or 80 years. And I also talked about this on the, about what did I learn in a war zone. And one of the points that I made right at the end is I said, I, I've learned in a war zone that it's very hard to die until it's not. And, and what did I mean by that? I said, you... When you're conscious and when you're in the world and when you're trying to do a great thing, you have so much talent and you have so much potential and you have so much intelligence and we have people surrounding us with their own measure of talent and creativity and intelligence and we have this like congregation of sacred human beings that when they come together can send spaceships to the moon, that can perform operas that can care for millions upon millions of children and write beautiful fables that are deeply resonant with kids and help. They, you, we are so remarkable and so robust and it can all be snuffed out in a single instant and that all of us will get to some point in our life where we're sitting there and we know that we have now passed the useful part of our life. And every single one of us is going to look back on that and say, I was given the greatest gift that exists in the universe, and that is a life. And what the Sam Hill did I do with it? And if you sit there and go, I don't know, I was happy. 
it ain't going to go well for you, right? And then if you say, well, I, you know, I had trouble getting to the different peaks of it, I'm just like, what? have you thought about meaning or purpose? Have you thought about love? Have you thought about caring for people? Have you also grappled with this fact? And it's, this is one, because when you talk about privilege for us, the real privilege we have is being without pain. That's the real privilege, the greatest privilege I have in my life. What do you mean? I don't wake up with a shocking, terrible, chronic back pain. I don't have a person that I love that seeks death because their life is just so painful. Um, We're not sick all the time. That we can actually have hopes and we have dreams. Imagine if you're given this gift... Like I, I told a story on um, this podcast some time ago and I, I, and I said it at the time and I'll say it again. It's a little bit of a contested story, meaning I got told this by a person who saw it but when I shared it, the country director said that didn't happen but I, I don't know if that guy wasn't being defensive. But it was a story about these refugee camps in Thailand and there is a, we were working in five refugee camps right on the border of Thailand and Laos and in Thailand has very strict laws for refugees. So when you go into a refugee camp, they literally are fenced and you can't really leave and you can't work. So you're like um, you're stuck there your whole life. And uh, you're spending maybe 50, 60 years in this camp. And so what we started doing is we started to – Thailand's famous for Thai silk, you know, it's this mm. gorgeous purple and this lovely golden silk they make. And so what we did is we trained all of these women to make this gorgeous Thai silk. And there was a a person that was on our board of our organization went to visit these women and she said she saw all of the silk being made and thought it was amazing. And then after it, and then they told her that she asked, what do you do with the silk? And they said, we sell it and we earn an income and uh, we do this. And they were like so happy and so proud of what they were doing. And then she came out and then she said to the team, I thought they weren't allowed to like work and sell things. And the team said, they're not. What we do is, and I'm, so part of this feels so wrong, but I suppose that's the point that I'm making, is they said, we pretend to sell it. So we we buy it. We give them the money. And she said, what do you do with the silk? And they took her down into a warehouse in the sort of forgotten corner of the refugee camp. And she walks in and there's just mountains of Thai silk that these people have made for 10, 20 years, that we've told them that we're selling and that their people are buying it and we're just sticking it in a warehouse. And what strikes me about that is that's an, you know, the world's biggest refugee camp has 565,000 people living in it. It's the Rohingya. The Rohingya are stateless people. No one, wa- no, they can't get a passport. Nobody wants them. There's a million Rohingya. Imagine no one wanting you. Not even a country willing to own you. Everybody just wanting to like forget you exist. And so the world's largest refugee camps, 565,000 people, they all live in bamboo dwellings. They can't have anything permanent in that camp. The whole camp's made of bamboo because the Bangladeshis won't let them do anything permanent. And yet there's nothing that will ever happen to these people. So when you talk about Thai silk, and we, you know Sibyl that we talk to? Mm. Because my daughter works with Sibyl and I'm friends with her. You know, Sibyl's always sick. She listens to this podcast. So I'm, hi, Sibyl. And I'm sorry to uh, hope this is okay. But she's always sick. And then you go, what is it? Like, um, she got a cold? She gets cholera all the time, typhoid all the time, malaria all the time. Because the water system in their camp is just rubbish. It's feeding her bad water. She's always sick with typhoid and cholera. She's the most beautiful, dynamic, special human being you'll ever meet. And she's put in this place in the middle of nowhere on the Tanzania border, 100,000 people forgotten. And she's and yet in that environment, she's created her own organization. She hasn't forgotten the other girls that surround her. She's got all these volunteers. They bring in the girls from around the camp. They're trying to teach them the code. They're doing the best they possibly can. She's doing the best she can. She's always sick. So you think, I'm happy? But she's, I, she's doing for others, right? Yeah. She's giving. Yeah. 
does that make her happy? Are the other people so that I'm make the silk say, happy? So I'm not. I, I'm just saying, happiness is like sparks on a campfire. The, you have a campfire to cook your food. You have a campfire to warm you. You have a campfire to keep away predators. You have a campfire to tell stories around. Yeah, there's sparks. Do I mean that I've never had moments? I get happy when I look at cat and dog videos. <laughs> but what I'm saying is life, we seem to think nowadays that life, I'm not trying to be that curmudgeon person, but we're liking this pursuit of happiness. And I'm saying, please, for the love of your worth, be in pursuit of meaning and goodness and purpose and why am I profoundly unhappy? And I'm not, I'm not asking anyone else to share this, but I know about Sibyl. I know about those refugee camps. I know what's going on in Somalia. I know what's happening in Congo. I know what's happening in Gaza with first hand. I know that the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan that has 75,000 Syrians in it has had 85% of its rations cut and they're not allowed to work and they're not allowed to go out and find other forms of food. Well, how do they feed their kids every single night? And so you've got to grapple with this. Now, then you say, well, Daniel, how does this fit with the whole finding good? What I'm just saying is these are not the majority. These are the minority of things. Can we do something about Zadari Camp? Yes. Can we do something about Sybil fixing the water system? Yes, we can. Is Sybil amazing and special and is she giving and is she laughing all the time? If you talk to Sybil, what you'll notice about her, she's laughing all the time. But she probably just got out of malaria for two weeks. So what we're trying to grapple with here is how do you live a worthy life? How do you live a worthy life? And I, we're all going to ask that question at some point. If I was given this, what would I do with it? And then even if you don't ask that question, your kids are asking it. They're looking at you. Mm. And... I want my daughter to be proud of me more than anything. And so the question we've got to answer, for, and it's back to link to that podcast about story, the first question that I said about my story is whatever story I choose, it has to be worthy of me. And it has to carry me through enough of life that it's not just worthy of me today, but when it adds up to 60 years, it was worth all that time that I put in. Now, does that mean you don't have moments of laughter and smiling and things like that? Yes. I've seen you smile. Yeah. <laughs> not often. Not often, no. <laughs> and I'm not saying everyone should – I really am not saying everybody should be like me. But what I am saying in this podcast is we tell ourselves three things all the time and I believe it's what's robbing us of this purpose. First thing we say is i got to eke out my own existence – Right, I, I got that, you know, I'm in this grand battle with the world and resources and I got to eke out my own existence and the world's not a friendly place. And then secondly, we go, and even if I help Sibyl or even when I help a homeless person or even when I help a, re, a well vision, what will you do with the money and what will you, will Sibyl really use it the way you're, I'm going, you can trust Sibyl. You can trust me. Like I'm not trying to, take everyone's money to do bad things. I'm trying to do good things with it. Right? So if, and then the third point would be you could sit and the worst lie of all is that me as an individual, I can do nothing. And all what we're saying on this podcast is you can hide behind those three answers and you can do your Netflix and do whatever your drug of choice is, but it's going to suck for you. So if you just realize the world is – much better than I think it is. There's no reason why the Thais can't buy that Thai silk from those refugees. There's no good reason. They just think there's, that there's not enough silk to go around. I don't know. And then secondly, that these people are bad and they're not. And then thirdly, that, that yeah, maybe as an individual, when we talk about all the stuff we talk about here, like you know, Rohingya, mm. you go, what can I do as an individual? I took a group of guys, social media influencers in there, they're called Love Army. Uh, Jerome Jar, a guy called Omar C, um, DJ Snake, yeah. right, was on there. <laughs> right, a whole bunch of those guys, we took them in there. They raised money from other young people all over the world. They built 3,000 homes in that camp, just those guys. 
and the social media group, you know, their influences. They built 3,000 of those bamboo dwellings. They put up water points all over the place. So you can do things. This is a terrible lie to think that you can't. Um, so it started with that's me what this asking is about. you. Yeah. <laughs> Why am I not happy? <laughs> Why are you unhappy? But this is what the podcast is about. And the podcast is not about happiness. Let's just <laughs> knock that on the head now. It's not about... Is happiness something that happens to you on the way? Is, is it something that happens to you on the way to finding meaning? You have a lot of belief in happiness. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it's written down as the theme for the, as the episode, so I thought I'd come back to it. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what, you know, there are things that make you happy. I don't think, I think you're right. I think, it, you know, the pursuit of happiness could be, God, that could lead you anywhere. So if you were to say, uh, so what's uh, the other bit that I, maybe I'll put this out cautiously, is what's a better feeling? You know, what's a better thing to commit to? And so, the thing that I would put out is the better thing to commit to is love and happiness. Love. And I think when we talk about love, what erodes... You don't mean romantic love. I don't mean romantic love, although that's, that's a good one too. But I, I, I'm, So I'll explain what I mean by love. Love in a way is to pour yourself out for the sake of another, right? So you should do that romantically with your partner, you, but you can do it for others... The, what kills love is actually not hatred, but it's fear. Fundamentally, the idea of love is a giving idea. Love's nothing if it doesn't involve you giving to the other person. What stops you giving is fear of what will happen when you give. So to my three questions, if you think there's not enough and you think that if I give, then I'll never get back and that I'm not going to have enough. And so I'll be without. Or that if I give, the second one, that if I can't trust people, if I give to them, they're going to abuse that gift, do it, use for something else or abuse me in that process. And even if I give, what I give is of no consequence. So those are three fears. And what we're trying to talk through on this podcast is the fact that those fears don't have to exist. If you think back to the episode we did with Mitch Tambo at the start of this season, and we talked about the, the racism towards him and the abuse he cops from, from people who don't know him purely because of, you know, how he was born and who he was born. He said, you know, and, and I quoted Stan Grant, he said he responds with love because that's what his people have always done. Is this, is this part of what you're talking about here? This is, you know, he's driven by love. So he's not afraid when someone's abusive towards him to say, you know, he doesn't bite back at <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, he does. He, he's incredibly special because... He knows all this when he's 30. Yeah. It took me years. I don't think he even think he knows it. I just think, I think it's that in he, him. I think, it's, I think if he was here, and I think he actually said this on the podcast, that he has this because he has his people and his ancestors and he's been taught this, hmm. that actually it was given to him as a gift is this. The problem that we have is that it feels doormatty. Right, like if, if I choose to love, transactional. Well, no, like I'm a doorman and people will walk over me. Oh, okay. Yep. That if I even for Mitch, that if he in the face of racism he chooses to love back, mm. that then I think people will think, well, that's just going to allow that racism to perpetuate itself. And the danger we I think we feel about we have a misunderstanding about love in that we don't understand we're right in this realm where when you talk about love and things like that you're in the realm of I don't know, we call it hippie or, uh, you know, I don't know what you, we get, I, I get uncomfortable talking about it. Maybe it's just me, <laughs> but, um, we think love is not, um, and now I'm thinking of the songs. <laughs> is mainly about, John Lennon songs. <laughs> that love has a transformative component to it. And I think we don't fully understand that. And I think that's what Mitch and is what indigenous people understand about love. Love is not simply the receiving of hatred and doing nothing about it. Like I'll, I'll, I'll give some very practical examples of this and it's, it's the non-violence movement. Gandhi, Martin Luther King, all of that emerges actually from a concept that was first put out by Jesus, which is, and it's probably the most controversial thing that he said or the thing that seems craziest among, 
is this idea that if somebody strikes you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. Now, I think the way most of us read that is that we believe that, um, well, they'll hit me once and then they'll hit a second time and then I'll turn it again and hit a third time and it just seems dumb. But is Jesus being dumb? And the nonviolence movement said the same thing, which is essentially as you, when your enemy strikes you, receive it and show up, come back at them with love, turn the other cheek. That, that, the nonviolence movement comes from that scripture. Right. And, but it is fundamentally based on the idea that a person will stop slapping you. <laughs> right? The idea that Gandhi had was not that the British were going to keep on coming and crush them. His belief was that if you show up in love and you turn the other cheek, that somehow that will stop the British. That Martin Luther King's view was that if I show up and turn my other cheek, this will stop the chronic, systemic civil rights injustices that his people had to face. Mm. They were trying to stop this stuff. That when Jesus said, turn the other cheek, he wasn't saying, hit me a thousand times. He was trying to stop his enemy from being his enemy. And the, the example that he used of the way the enemy showed up was through physical violence. So the way to transform a person from your enemy into your friend in that instance was symbolically to stop them engaging in violence with you. But really what all three of them are trying to do is transform the person from being your enemy to being your friend. But even more than that, they're trying to transform the people, these people from people that would hit you and strike you and be your enemy into people that will return love to you. And so that's the idea of love. In, in MLK's specific situation, he had Malcolm X on the other side doing completely the opposite, yeah. which wasn't helping. I believe the fundamental – so you, you had an interesting example in the civil rights era. You had Malcolm X and you had Martin Luther King. Hmm. And I'm not in any way disrespecting either of those two people and I'm not there's – n- there's no dish here. Yeah. But what I would say is you have two very different views – and I believe at its heart, and this is back to story, it was, it was a view about what humans are really like. There's one view that says people are bad and they want to hit you and you need laws and you need, you need to be stronger to stop them. And then there's another view which is that deep down a person does not want to hit you but they feel compelled for whatever reason and you've somehow got to win that, beat that. And the idea that Martin Luther King had and Gandhi had and Jesus had was that you need to give them permission to be who they want to be and the way that you do that is by engaging in a loving way. And that as you do that, you give p- people permission to be, in, you know, the cliche, the best version of themselves, they'll choose to do that. And it's also been my experience. So when you talk about what's the story that guides my life, that's a fundamental one to me. That if I deep, if I really believe a human being is sacred and remarkable, they're desperately trying to be that. The whole world is designed to stop us being like that, and so it needs. We need partners. We need friends. We need family that is constantly giving us permission to be that, and they do that by loving us. And that's what we're challenging or asking people to do through this podcast is we're trying to give people permission to be loving. And that if they and to realize that if they choose that route, the what there is enough that you won't suddenly be without, and that people won't return love with hatred, and that actually the combination of all those things will produce something remarkable. So it's finding good, not finding happiness. Um, <laughs> and this is Daniel Wordsworth, profoundly unhappy but full of love. Uh, you can follow Daniel on his socials or go to the website danielwordsworth.com. I'm glad I asked that question. <laughs>